This video answers the question, how do you know how good your risk analysis is? And poses four possible answers. First, you can evaluate the consistency of your process and methodologies against best practices and accepted frameworks. Second, you can calibrate values and judgments against ground truth to assure that these measurements reflect reality and their intended meaning. This is particularly important for probabilistic values. Third, you can evaluate the informativeness or improved discrimination capability of your assessment compared to long-run statistical averages to assure that the risk analysis improves upon aggregate data and yields insight. Finally, you can evaluate the impacts to key stakeholders of your analysis on their decisions and actions that the added discrimination potential improves these decisions and actions. Before we go too far, I want to make sure to dispel some myths that calibration of probability judgments is too difficult. You might have heard these myths before. We can't estimate probabilities because we don't have perfect data, or collecting data in uncertain areas is not worth it, or my sponsor doesn't understand probabilities. Well, the reality is we use probabilities when we don't have perfect data, not despite of its availability. The value gained from any kind of evidence or information is greatest when the uncertainty is greatest. There's the biggest return on investment for using any kind of uncertain judgments even when there's great uncertainties. And third, we as risk analysts frequently do a poor job of explaining probabilities. The reality is that whenever we use uncertainty or include uncertainty in decision-making processes, we always will improve the value to the decision. This is an example of a really simple proof, mainly just for illustration. It's from Granger Morgan and Max Henrian's book about using uncertainty in quantitative risk analysis and policy. And they basically show that any time we include uncertainty information in a decision-making process, it always improves the decisions and has a positive impact. So how do we measure a good risk analysis? Well, there are three things to talk about. First is consistency. We can talk about consistency from three different perspectives. First, the life cycle phases of the risk analysis that we do. This is, how do we set goals? How do we involve stakeholders? How do we identify the right stakeholders? How do we understand constraints, both in terms of the budget for the analysis as well as our organizational constraints, skills, data? How do we actually control the analysis and the assessment processes so that they uh, are performed accurately and consistently? How do we then measure the performance as we're going through this analysis. And then another perspective is these the actual implementation steps. How do we know when we've identified all the what can go wrong events? Where do we get the data? How much data do we need? How far down a process do we need to go in order to verify that we understand probabilities and consequences associated with each risk event? What kind of sensitivity analysis do we do? Under what circumstances? How are decisions made with respect to the risk analysis that's done? And how do we continually monitor and improve and iterate the risk assessment? And then finally, there's the incorporation of analytic principles into the risk assessment itself. Have we adequately and broadly included all the factors of the system? Have we acknowledged that there are multiple competing objectives? Do we use multiple models or do we try to ignore certain perspectives of the system? How do we incorporate uncertainty? How do we incorporate the fallibilities of humans or the human systems in, in the processes? How do we understand cascading failures and how do we recognize that the system is dynamic and changing over time? These are consistency measures, processes that have been, that are kind of distributed across the literature, but these are the foundations by which we can compare our risk assessment process and methodology to make sure that it is accurate. Next is the calibration and discrimination processes of the, uh, of the risk assessment. And I use a pretty simple illustration just to illustrate what I'm talking about. On the x-axis are the predicted estimates. These are when we ask someone to estimate the probability that something bad is going to happen. And then on the y-axis are the actual ground truths. Now this might not be the way that we do the calibration. There are several ways to do this. But this helps us to illustrate these concepts. The blue line describes a perfectly calibrated individual. Every time they say something is 0.2 probability, it happens 20% of the time and it doesn't happen 80% of the time. Every time they estimate things with 80% probability, it happens 80% of the time and it doesn't happen 20% of the time. Now, the red line illustrates a, a collection of judgments. Let's say that there are 50 or more. And we've actually uh, counted how many, how many times for each of the judgments the event has actually been realized as true. And so you can see that when they estimate 20% probabilities, about 70% of the time, uh, those events actually happen. Whereas when they estimate 60% uh, probability, it only happens about 40% of the time. This individual is overconfident. They believe they have more certainty in events than they should based on the information that they actually have. And their predictions are inconsistent with the realities. They are uncalibrated and not very discriminative. Now, the white dots 
actually show the results of an individual who is very well calibrated. You'll see that their predictions are very close to the blue line. For example, when they estimate the events that they estimate at 60% probability, they happen about 60% of the time. And the events that they estimate at 30% probability, they, they happen about 30% of the time. But notice that these are clustered around the 50-50 uh, time frame. So this person is very well calibrated, but they're not very discriminative. They're not really producing any kind of predictive power. Um, they're not being able to predict whether events are going to happen or not. Whereas the individual with that's represented by the black dots is both calibrated and discriminative. They're able to produce many more predictions of zero, certainty that the event won't happen, or one, certainty that the event will happen. And they're still, they're, the collection of their predictions are still consistent with the actual predictions that they're making. Now this calibration and discrimination has lots of opportunities and there are lots of processes which we can go into in another video. The last thing to talk about is value. To illustrate value, we need to start with the end in mind. Just having a consistent process that has calibrated and discriminative uh, values doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to actually produce impact on the decisions in a positive way. For example, when people go to the Weather Channel, they don't necessarily want highly predictive weather. They want to feel comfortable that they're getting information. And that comfort is part of the value that the risk assessment is providing. So how do you do this? Well, you should start with the end in mind. What are you going to measure in terms of the performance of the risk assessment? How will you evaluate requirements? To what extent is calibration and discrimination important? To what extent do you need to comply or be consistent with certain analytic processes, implementation steps, or principles? What constraints do you have from data elicitations or from human involvement? What's your budget? What stakeholders do you need to appeal to and how do you get them involved? And then finally, from that, you can start deriving your analysis goals that will help you to achieve the greatest value in your risk assessment. I hope this has been helpful in introducing these concepts. I'll make additional videos that go into more details for each of these evaluation perspectives.